you know, there's a lot of concern over how you look on camera. I just want to say, <laughs> Dota's been in here, she's fixed it all up because yeah. it was too blurry. Yeah. And there might have been complaints. There might have been complaints, yeah. There could have been. Um, From? No, I mean, look, I, I <laughs> sarcastically said, say? no, I said, tongue in cheek, I said, we don't disappoint the female viewers. Yeah. So, and then I wonder, was that tongue in cheek now or is there? Well... I mean, I'm just going to say just before that, you said to me, my hair looks very nesty while you looked I at it. I actually said, I'm going to have to get something done with this hair tomorrow because it's gone back to looking like a nest. And I said... Every I, couple of weeks, I look at it and it's like I have a nest placed on my head. And I said, whenever you say something like that, I just go, hmm, which is a non-specific... Does that mean you're afraid to say one way or another? Well, I'm not going to say, oh yeah, your hair looks really, really nesty. You better do something about it, nor... Am I going to get creepy and say, no, your hair looks fantastic, Nicola. Don't worry about it at so all. You've just worked out that you say nothing. No, yeah. grunt non-specifically yeah. where it could be taken either way. So. And then, of course, in she comes to fix the cameras to yeah. make sure that you're crystal clear for your ladies. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Such yeah. a weird job, isn't it? It really is. But on more serious matters, we were talking earlier in the newsroom and you were telling me that you had had some interaction with Anna Finnegan's family. And which is why we're going to talk about this story um, on a podcast. You're going to tell me about this guy, Vessel Jahiri, who sounds like the absolute last kind of a guy you want your daughter or your sister or any woman, you know, to meet. And Anna Finnegan was only 15, was she, when she She was 15 or 16 when, when she first met him. Um, and... He murdered her brutally in September 2012. And then almost... What age was she then? She was 25. Right. So almost 12 years later, um, his appeal was, I mean, it was rejected out of hand yesterday. You know, judges are, as you know, tend to be very careful in their language. But I mean, it was absolutely thrown out. It was described as no coherent grounds for an appeal. Um, you know, just basically described as as kind of ridiculous by the judges, right. uh, filled with conspiracy theories. And, you know, it brings it back to me because in that 12 years, mm. um, the family and Anna's friends, some of who I've been in touch with, they've had to suffer the grief of losing a loved one in those manners. Fessel Jahiri was arrested um, a couple of days later. I can't even remember if it was a day later or two mm. days. But in that time, they have gone through that criminal justice system. It's been so a, He's refused. He obviously pleaded not guilty and was convicted of murder. He was, well, he appealed. Yeah, he has appealed. Um, but if you see the the kind of the, the torturous route that that, the criminal justice process has taken for that family. Mm. It is quite amazing. Like there was, first there was, um, there was an initial trial. Mm. Um, during that trial, uh, I think it was 2015, ultimately the jury failed to reach a verdict. So he appeared every day. Um, what happened to Anna was, to go back to the basics of the story, um, she was 15 or 16 when she met Vessel Jahiri. He was uh, from Kosovo. He'd arrived in Ireland. He told people that he had been a child soldier during the Kosovo conflict. Now, it was never clear if that was fully true or not, but that's at least what he went around telling people. Um, she was 15 or 16 when she met him. He was a few years older, maybe three or four years older. None of her family were delighted with it, but he seemed like, you know, a nice guy and was certainly kind of obsessed with her at least. They didn't necessarily get a good feel of him, but, you know, what can you do? Um, and she had a, a, a couple of kids as a, you know, as a teenager mm. really to him. Um, um, and it became apparent over time that if if the relationship had started okay, it, it you know it certainly deteriorated very very quickly. And you know you have to remember this is a very young girl with very young children, not necessarily lots of money, good family support, but you know it's struggling. And he was beating her obviously on a regular basis. Not only beating her, um, he did a lot. What a lot of these guys do. Um, he he had sort of effectively banned her from seeing her family, right. isolated her, and 
all of of control and all those things going on. 100%. Toxic, toxic relationship. 100%. And that's what the family would describe it now as coercive control, which yeah. is now a, a criminal yeah. a, a criminal offence, but wasn't at that stage. She had tried to get away. Mm. When she tried to get away, um, they obviously had a couple of kids together. He would use that, use the custody of the children. Mm. Um, he would threaten to hurt himself constantly threatened to hurt her family if she left them. Um, at some point, uh, she'd spoken to her sister. Her sister had given her good advice, just get away. Mm. Um, and she had spent time before her murder in a, a woman's refuge in Wicklow. Um, you know, at that stage, she's only 25, Jesus still really, Christ. really young. Yeah. Um, while she was in the, the woman's refuge, he had, he had been in touch with her over the children, you know, the way these things go. Mm. And... Um, he, he, you know, his sister later told me, you know, how um, he had told her if she's, if she doesn't come back, he was going to kill members of her, for her family. Right. Um, so all of this was going on. She was li living in fear. Like there was just a constant stream. You can of imagine violence. a guy like that being able to get at her and to feel the, the confidence of threatening her while she's in a, a, a sheltered accommodation like that, a women's refuge, where yeah. she's obviously, you know, somewhat dealing with, and speaking to other people outside the relationship, what's going on, and yet he still feels the confidence and threatener. And you can, look, I talk to loads of people who knew her, or a good few people who knew her, but also you get a sense over time of what sort of person she was. Mm. And she had obviously been, like, it was her first love or whatever, you know, um, but, like, she wasn't, she was, by all accounts, just this lovely, soft, well-meaning you know, good hearted person who looked after her kids, even despite what he was doing to her, seemed to have concern for him, for his his mental health, was still trying to kind of help him, even as she was trying to break up with him. Um, you know, she was living a sort of one of those kind of blameless good people who tries to see the best in other people, you know, and you can even see that from her, her kind of pictures, that mm, kind of mm. you can see that kind of softness in her face. And that's that's exactly how she was described by everybody who came across her. So what has happened basically is he, he'd been on the phone to her. She'd gone back to her house where her brother was staying. Um, he, he, he knew she'd gone back for a while. He kicked in the door um, and uh, stabbed her brother and then stabbed her. Um, her brother was stabbed in the head and I think at the side, very lucky to be alive. Um, then she had been stabbed in the chest. He'd bundled her in the back of the car then, drove her to the hospital, dropped her off, but she died from knife wounds shortly after. Mm. Um, so like a more clear case of a murder, it's very hard to, mm. to get. So, but instead then what happened was, despite the fact he kicked in the door and stabbed everybody, yeah. Um, he had, he put the family through kind of hell, through the courts, basically saying, um, oh, the brother, I went into the house and the brother kind of fought me off and Anna got stabbed in the chest by accident as a result of trying to break it up and it was self-defense. Like all of this is really, really tough on people. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, so he had an initial court, initial trial. Um, the evidence was heard. It looked obviously like he was going to be found guilty. Um, as it got to the point which the jury were going to have to make their verdict, he just disappeared. He right. Just, he just disappeared. Right. Now... Wasn't in custody. Wasn't in custody. Um, he just disappeared. Right. Um, he kind of went on the run. So amazingly then the jury went out and came back, couldn't come back with a verdict. Um, there was obviously a retrial was going to be ordered. Yeah, just for anyone listening yeah. who doesn't understand that, the hung jur jury, it's called, it means they can't find a unanimous verdict and nor can they usually find a majority verdict. Is a yeah. majority verdict acceptable in murder? There, there can be, it, it can be acceptable if the judge yeah. decides if the judge it sends them back. Yeah. The judge realises maybe a jury are struggling, they're taking quite a lot of time. He will call them back or, or she will call them back and ask them, are they near, you know, how would they yeah. feel about a majority to go out? And they often come back with a majority. If they can't come back with a majority, which is a 10-2. Yeah, it could be 11-1 so, or 10-2. Yeah, 11-1 or 10-2. But if it's under that, yeah. so if it's 9-3, it's called a hung jury. Yeah, and in which case... So they're not finding somebody no, innocent. No, no. But they're not... 
yeah, agreeing at all on whether they're, they're they are or they aren't. Um, it's a complex situation, and usually, it can come after complex trials where there's a lot of complex evidence. Um, it's a nightmare scenario for everyone concerned, for the court system, for the families, for the guardy, because you essentially have a situation where someone is retried again and they're yeah. right back to square one. Yeah. You're practically might as well be back in the district court again the first day they've been charged and you have to gear up and build up for another trial, all those witnesses coming forward, giving evidence, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's look, he managed at that trial, obviously, to sort of pour some, some sort of shade on, on the actions of the brother. I mean, a blameless, decent human being that that brother is and um, mm. who really suffered. I mean, was lucky to be alive. But somehow you can never, a court is a lottery. But obviously he felt he was going to be found guilty and he just went on the lam in the, like, which is really uncommon. I mean, I don't think you've heard of that necessarily. Anyway, so you couldn't really, a bench warrant was ultimately issued for his arrest. Um and there was fears he'd gone back to Kosovo or gone somewhere mm. in mainland Europe. But really, he was kind of floating around the place um, amazingly, even though there was a bench warrant issued. Eventually... Was he living in the homeless community? No, he wasn't living in the homeless community. He, In, in fact, he, he'd been, um, you know, he'd been given, uh, he'd been on bail and somebody had, had put up a lot of money for him to, 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 to come on bail. I mean, so look, that went on. Um, Eventually, it came back to court. Um, another trial. Another trial. Look, ultimately, what happened is so clear and unequivocal. Yeah. I mean, you heard evidence of the hell that he had put that girl through for years. And I mean, really, really, mm. look, this is horrific stuff. I mean, she was in fear for her life for years. Mm. Just this constant isolation, brutalization. Uh, you know, manipulation, just, just terrible. Um, but obviously then it went back to trial in 2000, I think it was 2017. Um, yes, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2017. In there, uh, it started to go wrong for him. Now, right. what happens with these guys, and you'll know this over your career as well, these guys, these controlling people, it's, if, they, if it's going okay for them, they can have a bit of charm and a bit of presence. But it's when it starts to go wrong and they get a sense that something is going wrong, they can lose the plot. Mm. They just can't cope with it. Um, now, ultimately, he fired his legal team. He went through, I think, over the, the course of these things, he fired five legal teams. Um, in the middle of the trial, he fired his legal team, decided to represent himself, um, didn't feel his legal team were... were he were, knew better. He knew better and his kind of general thing was these kind of broad conspiracy theories. He wanted to introduce evidence that guards were making this evidence up. I mean, look, it's just... People were out to get him. People were out to get him and this sort of, these picking out little bits of evidence and saying this was done wrong or whatever. Ultimately, um, in the middle of the trial, he he something wasn't going his way in court and he leapt out of the witness box and went up and punched the uh, prosecuting barrister in the face. Uh, had to be wrestled to the ground. Um, I've never seen that. Never seen that. I mean, this is somebody who's, who like is out of control. Yeah. Then he proceeded to basically disgrace himself in court in terms of, but he was still representing himself. So yeah. it, it was in a, you know, a difficult position. Uh, let's put it that way. Ultimately, uh, he was found guilty. Um, How did he react to that, do you remember? Well, he, he they were shouting and roaring and all of the usual stuff. But everyone was wrong. Everyone was wrong. And, you know, again, he ultimately appealed the case again. And, you know, it, can, it comes back to court this week. It took a long time. The it takes a long time because he couldn't get a, well, according he to him, he grounds. couldn't get, well, he couldn't, but he had no grounds, but he was allowed to appeal anyway. Why was that? Well, he was, he was, I would have thought that you need proper grounds. I mean, the appeals courts are not going to be, everyone wants to appeal, especially on a conviction like murder. Yeah. They're going to give it a go, aren't they? Because it's life imprisonment. But I mean, I, w I thought you needed to identify grounds well, for appeal. Well, well, you need to identify grounds if you're going to win your appeal. But so, I mean, look, I'll just read it out to you because, because they say better. 
Um, he represented himself in front of the Court of Appeal. He, When it came back to the initial hearings, um, he was told it's not wise to represent yourself. And he said he couldn't find anybody to represent him. Um, he fired five legal teams. The judge was saying there's 150 barristers on the thing. You'll find somebody. So he either was unwilling or unable to find somebody to do it. Um, but he was obviously allowed, as you said. You're, you, you, so again, to de, to describe it, pe many people will know. An appeal court, you 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 have to kind of really appeal on a point of law. Yeah. Or you can't say uh, for effectively, you know, that that was just wrong. You have to give a legal reason, I suppose. But so it came. It came for it was the judgment was delivered this week, and it said the the, the court of appeal said he delivered inadmissible hearsay unsupported allegations, irrelevant material and submissions which were neither evidenced nor based on evidence. So, you know, he had all of these uh, grounds which were effectively uh, conspiracy theories that he'd been stitched up by the police. Um, in dismissing appeal, Mr. Justice McCarthy said Jahiri had challenged not merely the accuracy of Garda evidence against him, but alleged a Garda conspiracy to manufacture evidence and that false evidence had been given. None of this is justified, said Justice McCarthy, who said Jahiri's assertions in part or altogether had not been advanced beyond allegations of bad faith. Mm. So effectively, I'd say the court gave him the opportunity. He has to appeal. They warned him, you have to produce either evidence or 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 points of law. Yeah. He didn't do that. He just went in and made these assertions yes. that he was a victim of this conspiracy. And one of which was that the trial judge failed to stop the trial yeah. and directly be found not guilty because he wasn't allowed to inspect the knife. Inspect the knife. And he had some... some that was uh, used to kill Anna. Yeah. So effect, I don't know how the, the knife was... was you know, whatever evidence process I went through. And he was trying to claim that if... He, if he was personally entitled to examine it. Yes, because if he had, he'd be able to show the pattern of fingerprint show that he was acting in self-defense because there was other things. But I mean, again, the judges said to him again and again, these complaints were raised at the time. They were put before the jury. The jury made a decision. And this is another thing that 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 when you come to an appeal... If the evidence is put before a jury in its in entirety, the jury heard it all, it's explained to them from both sides, the jury are entitled to make a decision on the whole of the evidence. Yeah. Um, and if you're going to appeal that, you have to show in some way not all the evidence was given there or if if or that the jury didn't hear of this bit of evidence that could have changed their mind. Merely just going back to it and saying the jury, made, effectively what he's saying is the jury made a wrong decision. Yeah. The courts aren't going to entertain that. The jury system is still paramount and that people, um, you know, the jury are entitled to make a decision. Mm. And that's, that's we recognise that. Um, he, and then also it was this, um, I, I was told the other day as well, he started shouting about the Gardaí being the mafia because he was only allowed to appear on video link for, yes. this, for this appeal judgment. And Mr. What jail just, is he in, do you know? I'm not sure actually, um, I know he was in the Midlands at one point, right. I'm not sure if he's still there. But he said, uh, Mr. Justice McCarthy said, Jahiri had accused the Gardaí of involvement in a conspiracy to induce witnesses to give such evidence and to suppress relevant evidence. It, it now just, all the while, the family... Uh, and his family and friends and, and loved ones in the background have had to wait all this time for this guy to have his next outing, which has yeah. failed for him. But that's it, yeah? Well, no, I mean, he actually, I think he shouted on completion of the evidence that he would take his Supreme. appeal to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Now, the courts well, are... Will and all. Well, he will, but I mean, the court, the Supreme Court, again, is even more technical. So, look, I think the courts, uh, if you're convicted of murder, they're going to allow you to yeah. have an appeal. Yeah. I mean, I think because of the, the gravity of the sentence. So, you know, and this appeal, you know, I remember the initial hearing, it was never going to be successful. Yeah. It was just never going to be successful. Um, but, you know, you And, have you know, when you look at his age, he, so he's 43, yeah, right? Yeah, And it was 2012 when Anna Finnegan was stabbed to death. Yeah. So he would have been 31 then. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Am I right? Sorry, I know I'm really... 
crap at well, this, but I'm yeah. just trying to work. So he was 31 then. So Anna was 25 at the time. Yes. So he was six years older than her. Well, maybe five years, I think. Something okay. along those lines. Which is a lot. It's a lot. And for, especially when you think when she was 15, he would have been 20. Well, I think it was 16 was said in court. Well, then I, 16, yeah. 21. That's yeah. a big difference at that stage. That is a big difference. You know it's what I mean? Difference. So he was... He was much older than her even when he started that relationship with her. He was much older than her and, you know, people at the age of 16, I think we're we're talking in another part of the forest, they don't know their own minds. This girl... um, Because they're not developed They're not developed, yeah. So she met this guy who gave her this big victim story and I think I never met her obviously, but from all accounts, she was one of these kind of people with a really good heart who really felt for this guy and his struggles and where we come from in terms of the war, you know, felt a responsibility. And people like that, they compete, they, they, they prey on that, mm. that, that good nature. And two children left without either parent. Left without either parent, you know. I mean, really, really shocking. And um, a, a brother who's obviously traumatized having nearly lost his life and mm. then had to which you know and witnessing his sister witnessing his sister's murder and also having to go through court cases where his character is unjustifiably you know attacked by Jahiri you know um I can't imagine you know the way you know you hear of people and they've lost loved ones and in, in horrific crimes and stuff and they talk about forgiving yeah. the offender I mean I cannot I'm looking at him and I can feel the hatred welling in me yeah. and I have no yeah deep-seated connection to this case at all other than what you're telling me here today. Yeah. Can you imagine, you know, he, him having killed your daughter or your sister, yeah. your, you know, your child? Your, yeah, look, I mean... How do people ever... I, I don't know. I mean, look, this is the reality. Like you, And you'll know this as well from talking to people over the years. Do, they, do people ever recover from that no. kind of loss? I mean... A violent I, sudden death. Yeah. Of any, you know, a sudden death. A violent sudden death carried out at another person. I don't think you could ever. I mean... There was an interesting uh, case recently about an American woman, I think it was, was it that, mm. that her her son had been killed by, in, by, in ISIS and she had gone and spoken to one of his killers and, you know, in a, in a bid to find killed forgiveness. By ISIS. Killed by ISIS. He killed, no, ISIS. he was killed by ISIS. Yeah. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a Foley, uh, James mm. Foley, and he'd been killed by ISIS and obviously by expat British guys who joined ISIS. Yeah. And she had spoken to them about forgiveness. Oh, and I mean... He was filmed and everything while they had... Yes. Like, so, but look, she had some sort of peace in, you know, speaking to the person who did it and why he did it. But I mean, I think... A case like this one with Vessel Jahiri, this is a man you cannot. It's it's another matter to forgive somebody who won't accept responsibility. No, he's still fighting, still like fighting. It's fighter still his, yeah, yeah, still. And you know, if he had a chance, would still be intimidating witnesses, yeah. blaming. Um, you know, it's I be a I, difficult character as well for the prison service to to um manage. I mean, you can only imagine. The, the arrogance, I suppose, and that single-mindedness of him, how that works behind bars in, yeah. in that pressure cooker, which is prison. Yeah, I mean, I know in the Midlands there's a lot of, um, you know, there can be certain groups of Eastern European prisoners or whatever together. Um, I don't know if he's in, what his situation in prison is. But I wonder uh, as well with some of these guys, they're big, uh, tough guys around women or around barristers. Like barristers aren't the toughest of guys, no, are they? No. So you can punch a barrister or shout at a judge. I wonder, is he in prison? Is he, you know, roughing up the big boys? I'd mm. say there's a good chance he's as quiet as a mouse and 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 doesn't the, push. A where bully, he, you mean? A bully. Mm. A bully. Mm. I mean, look, I I I've I have no concerns that he'll go to the Supreme Court and get out. It just won't happen. He yeah. may well end up in the Supreme yeah. Court, but he won't get out. Um, and, you know, it just shows you some people don't deserve to get out. You know, no. and I'm, you know, me, I'm the... But in the meantime, that family are going to have to deal with the next, you know, communication they get probably from the system yes. is that, sorry, but he's applied to the Supreme Court. I mean, their hearts must sink the every heart, time he... Yeah, the hearts must sink and, and, and you know... Again. And, you know, uh, you know, it's easy for me to say he's not getting out, but, mm. you know, you're not going to feel that if you're, you know, if you're the, the victim's family. Well, yeah, of course, because, you know, sometimes you hear about these things that fall on a technical issue. And exactly. and when people are that engaged with finding a problem 
in in the trial process or mm. in their justice process. You know, sometimes if you look hard enough, somebody's made a mistake somewhere. So you'd always have that worry. You would, you would always have that worry. And look, there was great people who who that were around Anna that mm. supported her, that came to court, that gave evidence, that, you know, friends that took her in, looked after her, gave her advice, had her staying even just in the run up to her, her murder, gave her somewhere safe to stay. And look, it's just really, really tragic that, 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 you know, that it didn't, that, that she couldn't get out, do you know? Do you know, like in a trial with somebody like him who was really going to agitate and try and find, you know, that sort of a mistake, I often think I would be the worst. You'd be as, yeah. imagine you and I. Yeah putting together the documentation, yeah, yeah. the arrest warrants, yeah. and how many like nights sleep would you lose? Yeah, of I course. I would be sick going yeah. into court yeah. if I had been responsible for, you know, those warrants. Because even a slight slip up on those warrants and search yeah. warrants and this, that and the other and arrest warrants can result in a whole trial falling. Or I would not be able no, for that no, level of pressure. No. In court, you know no, what I mean? Of course. And then, you know, it's just to think. Like, and even like when somebody's in arrest yeah. and the breaks that they have to take it, all of that can be brought up in their defense that they weren't given enough of a yeah. break or that they weren't, their medical needs weren't, you know, attended to. And yeah, oh, I, I just I, I think a certain type of a person with a very calm demeanor and yeah. probably attention to detail, which I mean, both of us kind of <laughs> are not our strong point. Maybe Definitely not our strong no. point. No. But I mean, look, in this case, it's, it's, you know, you, you come across some people who, who, who commit crimes, maybe to get sucked into something they didn't expect to, or even have a moment of madness. And it's possible mm. to feel sympathy for them. This guy, Mm. It just doesn't seem to, it just, it's just impossible to, 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 to feel that it's, it's anything but good that somebody like that is behind bars for a long time. I mean, somebody like that has obviously been able to take a life of yeah. somebody that he was supposed to have loved, was the mother of his two children, able to take that life and it not to, you know. No, to not to care. Anything. Not, not to care. care, just to find it an yeah. inconvenience that he, 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 you know. That he's, that he's punished been, for it. Yeah, and being held responsible. Yeah. Extraordinary. Okay, well, thanks for that. Thanks, Nicola. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs, and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.